Good morning, everybody. Um, chapter six today. So we're going to build on the stuff we learned in chapter four, which was supply and demand curves and finding an equilibrium. And then chapter five, who remembers what chapter five was last class? Elasticity, exactly. So we're going to take these two concepts, put them together, and say what happens in the marketplace, basically what happens in the cross, the intersection of the supply and demand curves when the government gets involved. Okay, because previously we had just uh, assumed that there really was no government and the quantity supplied equal to quantity demand. Buyers and sellers met in the marketplace and they started making transactions. Okay, now we're going to try to make it a little more realistic and we're going to add the government and talk about some different uh, things the government does. So two of the things the government can do to uh, affect a marketplace is they can set a price ceiling or they can set a price floor. Um, and so I'll tell you what those are and I'll give some examples, okay? Um, and then maybe the more important question is like, does this help the marketplace? Does it mess up the marketplace? What's, what's going on here, right? Okay, when the government makes price ceilings and price floors. Obviously, if the government's putting in price ceilings and price floors, they're probably trying to help something. I mean, generally, most of the government policies are, might have unintended negative consequences, but they're generally intended to help a certain group of people, right? And then finally, the, the third way that governments can get involved in the marketplace, and this is very common, is taxes, right? We didn't even have anything about taxes last time we were talking about buying and selling. But almost every time you've ever purchased or sold something in your life, you've probably had to pay some sort of tax on it, right? So it would be an unrealistic assumption to, to not talk about taxes. Um, and then we will look at the effect on the marketplace if the government taxes, makes the buyers pay the tax, if the government makes the sellers pay the tax, half and half, we'll kind of, we'll decompose that, those effects. And then finally, we'll talk about another thing called the incidence of a tax. That's a, another way of saying like, who's hurt more by the tax? Um, and uh, what kind of things determines who is harmed more by the tax? When we're done with that, we'll all go home. All right, so let's begin. Uh, Again, the, the three kind of government policies that the government can impose in a marketplace. Now re recall from chapter four, and maybe any other economics class you've ever taken, the price and the quantity in a marketplace is determined by whom? Any one specific person? No. It's just the coordinated effects of buyers and sellers, right? Um, the, the individual sellers are so many, and the individual buyers are so many that none of them can set the price. Do you remember what that's called when you're not able to set your own price? A price taker, right? So everybody's a price taker. And, and the, the way we think about this competitive marketplace, right, is someone shows up to a swap meet, either the buyer or the seller, and they're just told what the, what the, sale, what the, the market price is, right? Uh, how is that market price determined? Well, it's just determined because it's the only price that equalizes the supply and the demand, the quantities of supply and the quantity of demand, right? And so we have this market quantity and we have this market price. The, um, the quantity and the price are not determined by any single person. Right? It's just the coordinated action and, and reactions and buyers and sellers both trying to rip each other off and then they come to an agreement finally and they make the purchase or the sale, the sale and that's what determines the price and the quantity. Okay, so this is in the absence of government interference. We're going to talk about the three ways which governments can get involved and to change this, this, uh, um, this outcome. Okay, so, so the first thing they can do is price controls and there's two types of price controls. The first is a price ceiling. This is exactly what it sounds like, right? The government says, hey, there's a ceiling on the price. You cannot charge above this price, okay? You cannot charge above this price. That's called a price ceiling. So um, not super common, but the most common example that it happens is, is rent control, okay? In New York City, for example, it's illegal to charge more than, I don't really know what the dollar value is right now, but let's say $1,500 for a one-bedroom apartment. Okay? The city has imposed rent control. We call that a price ceiling. Okay? The price can be under $1,500, but it cannot be over $1,500. That's what the price ceiling means. 
right? Like the ceiling here, I can stay under the ceiling, but it, I can't get above the ceiling. All right. Okay, the other thing that they can do is a price floor. This is much more common. Uh, this is where the government says, there's a floor. The price can be up here above the floor, but it can't be below the floor, right? Just like this floor. Okay, if I look at it right now, I can be above the floor, but I can't be below the floor. Okay, an example of this is the minimum wage, right? In general, the wage that we pay to somebody is the price of the labor that we're purchasing, right? We're buying somebody's labor as the factory, so we're paying them a price. And the government says, hey, that price has to be above a certain amount. Right? The minimum wage in California right now is what? Nine, maybe nine flat, something like that. Yeah. Um, a lot of places are talking about, and this is really pertinent right now, right? How many places, including nationwide, are they talking about making a federal minimum wage that's like 10 or 12 bucks? In California, some places are talking about making a $15 minimum wage in California, right? So uh, we'll examine what happens uh, when the government steps in and sets a minimum wage which is a price floor. It's just saying the price has to stay above a certain number. Um, and then the third way, so it's one, two, the third way the government can get involved is through taxes. Okay? And uh, so the government can make buyers or sellers pay a specific amount on each unit sold. Okay? If, uh, if we remember back to our ShamWow example, uh, we show up to the flea market and we want to buy a ShamWow. Maybe I can go ahead and buy it for $5, but then I have to pay like 50 cents to the government or something like that, a dollar to the government in tax. Okay? Um, let's go ahead and use the supply demand model from Chapter 4 to figure out what happens on each of these three government kind of intrusions into the marketplace. So basically, the main thing that we're always going to look at, what are the two pieces of every equilibrium? Price and quantity, right? Any point on a two-dimensional plane, which is this xy coordinate surface, right? Any point tells us two pieces of information, the x, -ax the x coordinate and the y coordinate. In economics, we call them the price and the quantity, right? So, so we're going to look at how equilibrium changes. Another way of saying that is we're going to look at how the price and the quantity shift, right? That's the same thing as saying we're going to look at how equilibrium changes. OK, let's do it. Um, let's look at the market for apartments. Remember I told you that uh, in New York City they uh, have what's called rent control? Which one was that? Price ceiling, price floor. Who remembers? Price ceiling. Okay, so we're gonna look. We're gonna look at that. So here is um, the the market. We're gonna put price and quantity down. We're gonna do the or original uh, outcome with no government intrusion first. Okay. So here on the on the y-axis we put always put p. What's it gonna be? It's gonna be the price of apartments because this is the market for apartments. So it's always the price of apartments. Here it's the quantity of, part of apartments. And there is the demand for apartments, and there's the supply of apartments. Everything, you've seen this before, right? There's nothing new so far, OK? Uh, equilibrium without price control. So this is the equilibrium in the world with no government. Equilibrium in the world with no government. How did it get to this point? How did we find 800 and 300? Well, very simple. It was the only place that demand and supply were the same quantity, right? This is the only price where demand and supply are the same quantity. If the price were up higher, right, demand would be low and supply would be high, right? If the price were lower than this, then we have supply, which is low, and demand, which is high, and uh, there's not going to be an equilibrium, OK? So this is normal chapter four regular economics that you've always learned. There's no government intrusion yet. Everybody, everybody got it? OK. Let's suppose that the government institutes a price ceiling, and we want to see how it affects the market outcome. What does that mean, affecting the market outcome? How it affects the equilibrium. What does that mean? How it affects price and quantity. Okay? So anytime you see the word like market outcome or equilibrium, basically all we're talking about is, is price and quantity. Okay? Let's suppose the government institutes a $1,000 price ceiling. Let's suppose. What does this mean? What does a price ceiling mean? And exactly. The highest that you can sell or rent, depending on what you're thinking about for this apartment, um, is $1,000. Okay. So just kind of think about what that means. Is $800 a legal price? Is, I don't know, $1,500 a legal price? It's illegal. Okay. 
Now I want you to further think, how much are the apartments currently being sold for? So the government institutes a law. Does anybody really care? No. They're like, yeah, I mean, duh. <laughs> of course I'm not going to sell it over 1000 I only want to sell it for 800 right? So what we call that is we call this not binding. In other words, it has no effect on the market. Right? You imagine that you're a, an apartment rent, a, a seller, provider, some, a landlord, OK? who rents apartments, and the government says, you can't rent over $1,000. You're like, I wasn't going to anyway. I can only get 800 for this apartment. You didn't need to make that law. It's useless. Okay? That's what not binding means. Okay? So this is the key. If the price ceiling that the government institutes is above the equilibrium price, it's useless. We call that not binding. Now. Let's suppose a more realistic example, because what do governments do when they generally institute price ceilings like this? What's the point of it? It's to try to push the price down, right? So let's say that the government imposes a price ceiling of $500. This is more realistic. So question, now are people going to care about this price ceiling? They are. Because the landlords want to sell their or rent their apartments for how much? 800. The government says, is that a legal price, 800, or is that illegal? Illegal. Remember, price ceiling, you can do everything under the ceiling, just like I'm under the ceiling, but not, not above, nothing above it. Okay, so we got this issue. Um, we call this, so the equivalent price, 800, is above the ceiling and is illegal, right? So the landlords can no longer sell where they want to, right? We call this a binding constraint, right? If the other one was not binding, obviously this one had to be binding. OK. Right? You know like the, what the word binding means, right? It means like tightening or something like that, right? It's, this is, it's tightening on the price. The price is running into it. You can think of like my hands are bound by some rope. Same word, to bind my hands with rope. It's not letting me do what I want to do. That's why we say binding. OK, and here's the key. So what on earth happens to the marketplace? Do all of the, um, do all of the landlords just say, oh, OK, yeah, that's fine. I'm just going to rent for $500? No. There's a whole large number of landlords who say, for $500, it's not worth it to rent it. I'm just going to live in my own house, or I'm just going to, I don't know, let my kid live in it, or something like that, right? For 500 bucks, it's, not, it's no longer worth it. So they take their apartments off the market, right? And so if I look at $500, what's the quantity of supply? It's here. Does everybody see that? It used to be here, the quantity supply. Does that make sense? But the reduction in quantity from this point to this point comes because there are people for whom it's no longer a benefit to rent the apartment for $500. Maybe their opportunity cost of, of having the, the apartment is greater than $500, and so they can't, they can't do it. Anymore. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, what do you notice about the quantity demand at 500 bucks? Right, right. See, the quantity demanded used to be here, but now what happened to the quantity demanded? It went up. Okay? And this makes sense. College students who were living with their parents, right, all of a sudden the price gets cheaper. They're like, I'm going to move out and, uh, and get my own apartment. So suddenly the amount of, that is demanded goes up. The quantity that's supplied goes down. We have a huge issue. What's that called? Okay? Check it out. So let's put some numbers on it. Uh, let's say that it decreases. What did the equilibrium used to be? I think it was like 300 something. What was it? 300, something like that. Uh, the, some people took their apartments out of the marketplace because they didn't want to rent them because it's not enough money. More people came out of the woodwork and decided that they want to rent. And so now we have a shortage of 150 units. Whereas before, without the government's intrusion, we had 
300 people who wanted an apartment, 300 people who were willing to sell, and they, they made the exchange and everybody was happy. Right? Now we've got this issue where there's a shortage. And it's caused by the price ceiling. Okay. Take a step back for a second. Why do you think that the government imposed this price ceiling in the first place? Was it to screw up the marketplace? Probably not. I don't think the government is sometimes they're clueless, but I don't think they're ever trying to hurt people. <laughs> right? What are they what are they trying to do here? Probably. Make living more affordable, right? They're like, oh, this just prices are going up, going up, going up. So somebody had the bright idea, I don't know. Let's just make it illegal to have high prices on homes. Right? Um, I, so I, I have a feeling that they, they did it with the intention of improving living conditions, right? But what is the first thing that they did? They made a shortage. Does everybody understand how the shortage happens? It's pretty intuitive. It makes sense. Like it, this, this is definitely what happens. Um, and, and here's something else. In the long run, we know that what? Stuff is more or less elastic in the long run. More elastic, right? Which means that, remember, that the curves are less steep. Remember, as the, as the slopes go to zero, the elasticity increases. So think of, right, here they were really steep, but then in the, in the long run, they are now flatter. What does that do to the shortage? It actually increases the shortage. So now we got a shortage of 300, whereas last, in the short run, we just had a, uh, a shortage of like 150. So not only is the price ceiling bad right now, but the problem gets worse as the time goes on. Does that make sense? The problem gets worse as the time, price, as the time goes on. All right, let's talk about shortages because that's the main, if I were to ask you, what's the main outcome when the government institutes a binding price ceiling? What would you say? What's the main outcome? A shortage, right? Okay. Let me actually continue with pop quiz questions. What's the main outcome when the government institutes a non-binding price ceiling? Nothing, right? There's no change. Very good, very good. Okay, so shortages. Um, with a shortage, we have sellers must ration the goods among buyers. So what does rationing mean? Well, if there are more people who want it than I have available, there has to be some mechanism to distribute, right? Not everybody can get it, okay? So a simple rationing mechanism might be, hey, the first 20 people in line get the house, right? Um, and so that's one of them. But an, does that really happen in the apartment world? No, people, there's not like really lines. So unfortunately, this is the very, very common rationing mechanism is discrimination according to what the seller wants, right? I can now, as the seller, there is 150 people who want my apartment, so I can pick and choose. So what do I do? I pick and choose. Since I can't charge them the full price 800 that I wanted to, I can only charge all of them 500. I can pick and choose. Maybe I only sell to people of my own race, right? Or maybe I only sell to people of my own gender, or maybe I only sell to people of my own religion, or people with no pets, or right? There's like all kinds of discrimination that happens. Okay, in the marketplace, all by itself, with no, um, with no government intrusion, can there be any discrimination? No, I mean it's not really, it's they're not really able to because there is only exactly enough sellers and exactly enough buyers, right? So if the seller decides to, to discriminate and says no, I don't want to sell to that person, well he miss, loses out on his sale. Does that make sense? So really, it's not financially uh, worthwhile to have discrimination in, in the marketplace with no, with no government intrusion. However, now that there are more people, the sellers can pick, be picky and choosy, right? And now we have discrimination. Does that make sense to everybody? So like, oops. <laughs> now not only do we have shortages in the world, but we also have the need to ration or distribute the goods and that, that allows discrimination to pop through. Okay? And so, obviously, I don't need to tell this to you, but I'm writing it down. This is often unfair, right? And even worse, it's inefficient. We value efficiency in this class, right? Efficiency is the size of making the pie the biggest. Why is it inefficient? Well, 
We want the people who value the good the most, who need the apartment the most, and are willing to pay the most, to get an apartment. But if we let the sellers pick and choose according to their discrimination, that may not be true. Okay. We'll talk about that more next chapter. I won't actually talk about it too much more. Okay. However, in the government, in the marketplace with no government intrusion, right? The the regular marketplace, okay. What's the ra rationing mechanism? Well, there really isn't. It's just every seller. There's exactly as many sellers as there are buyers, right? And they just uh, they just pair up and, and make the sale, okay. And so. Things are impersonal and fair because people have the option to discriminate against the buyers. Does that make sense? Questions? So, so far, price ceiling, mm, I think it tried to help a problem, but it's really creating more problems than it's really solved. Right? OK, let's do the mar example number two. So the market for unskilled labor. Remember the example I gave in for Unskilled labor, generally people try to say, hey, you have to pay them at least a certain amount. Which one was that? Price ceiling or price floor? Price floor. OK, so let's go ahead and examine the market for unskilled labor. OK, um, before I do that, I, we just got to think a little bit because this is a weird market. Most markets, the demanders are like the households, right? And the suppliers are the factories. Right? So normally, wow, this is. I'm missing a whole ton of labels. This is a demand curve and this is a supply curve, right? For a normal good like a hamburger, who demands hamburgers? Household, right? And who supplies hamburgers? Firms, right? Exactly. Burger factories, whatever you want to call them, okay? However, there is one marketplace that's a little weird that we're going to talk about in this place, and it's known as the labor market, okay? Now, here's the weird thing. Who are the demanders of labor? Firms, right? So I'm going to put firms here. This is the opposite, because normally supplier, the firms are on the supplies curve, right? But in the market for labor, who are the people who are buying labor? It's the firms. Who are the people who are supplying the labor? Households. OK. So in this marketplace, the the, the people who are the supply and demand curves are, are flipped places. Does that make sense? OK. The demand curve still obeys all the laws of the demand curve, right? As price goes up, quantity goes down, and law of demand, all that good stuff. It's, it's all identical. It's just, it's just names, OK? The other name that's different is the price. We don't call it the price of labor. It's got its own name. What is it called? The wage, right? So let's just go wage. This is still actually a price. Right? So it's still a price. But um, we just represent it with a W. The reason why we do that is just to kind of clue us in that what we're talking about is the labor market. Because it is this one market that's different from the rest of them. OK? Does that make sense? So this would be the equilibrium wage. OK? So here I have the labor market. I have my price on the y-axis. Price is always on the y-axis. Uh, quantity is on the x-axis. Instead of quantity, what do I have here? L, which stands for labor, right? So this is still a price. This is still a quantity. Um, but I just have changed the, the, this is very common, by the way. I have changed the axes labels to re reflect the fact that it's the market for labor and not the market for a good. OK, so here's the, the price of unskilled labor also known as the wage. Here's the quantity of unskilled workers, also known as the number of labor, the amount of labor. OK, and then there's just the regular demand curve, which is the whom? The firms. And we have the regular supply curve, which is households. And then in the absence of any government intrusion, it's very simple to find the equilibrium wage, right? How do we do it? Where well, the lines cross. That's all we do in economics, find out where the lines cross. It's very simple. OK, so this means that $6 an hour paid to 500 workers, OK? This is how much the firms want to hire. This is how much people want to, want to uh, give of their labor, OK? If you imagine price going up, what happens? The quantity demanded goes down, right? Why? Firms can't 
afford to hire people if they have to pay them more, right? They can't, they can't hire quite as many people if you have to pay them more, right? However, what does supply do? As price goes up, what does supply do? It goes up. Why is that? Yeah. Well, yeah, if, if, if you tell me I can get paid more per hour, I'm like, sweet, I'll work more hours. <laughs> and, and all everybody in my family, we're all going to start working. Everybody who used to you know, be retired is now going to come back to work, right? So the, la the labor supply increases because, uh, hey, you can get higher pay, higher pay now, right? OK, so this is the plain old, this is the plain old uh, market for labor without any government intrusion. It's simple, same as chapter four. There's nothing actually new on this slide. The new piece is going to be what? A price floor. Okay? And the most common price floor is in the market for unskilled labor. And the, when we put a price floor in the labor market, what do we actually call it? It's got its own name. Minimum wage, right? It's exactly, it's, what is it? Price floor. Or a, the wage can't go under this floor thing. Okay? Let's suppose that the government institutes a minimum wage, which is the same thing as a price floor of five dollars an hour. Five dollars an hour. What does that do? Yeah. So one person says the demand goes down, one person says it doesn't do anything. What is the amount that work that, that firms want to pay workers right now? Six dollars an hour. The government walks in and says, it is illegal to pay less than $5 an hour. Nothing happens. The firm say, that's a worthless law. I wanted to pay people $6 an hour anyway. <laughs> I, I didn't need this law. Okay. What's that called again? When the, when the non-binding. Okay. Non-binding. Very good. So when the price floor is below the equilibrium price, it's non-binding. Remember, in the case of the price ceiling, it was when the price ceiling was above, but that's because it's the opposite thing. When the price floor is below, it's non-binding. OK, but um, in general, why does the government institute minimum wages? To increase standard of living. Which, because, and the way they're going to increase standard of living is by increasing the workers' wages, right? So, what the government's going to do is not put a price floor at five dollars an hour. Where are they going to actually put that price floor? Somewhere up above, up above six somewhere. It'll still be a price floor because it's still saying it's illegal to make the the price go under this amount. So let's say they put a price floor or minimum wage at seven twenty-five. This is more realistic because the government's not going to put a price floor less than what anybody's getting paid anyway. They're only going to put a price floor that's going to try to push the wages up, right? And now before you walked in here today, you may have just thought, hey, that's a good idea. If we just require companies to pay their workers more, workers will get paid more, people will be happier, right? It, it seems like a good argument. But let's analyze it using our tools of supply and demand. Okay, so just look at it. What's going to happen? So quantity, uh, the quantity used to be here, the quantity of demand, meaning the quantity that firms wanted to hire. Because remember, the the demanders are the firms now, right? So the quantity demanded used to be here at 500. When I raise the price to 725, what happens to the quantity? Yeah, quantity demanded goes down. Why is that a reasonable assumption to make? Right. If firms have to pay their workers more, they just can't hire more. Right? They, they're going to have to hire less, fewer workers. OK, so the demand goes down. Right? The, what do we say about the supply? Right? The quantity supplied used to be 500. But now people are coming out of the woodwork out of the houses here. And they're like, hey. I'll work now at 725 and it increases the quantity supply. Right? Maybe at this higher amount, it's we're enticing high school students to drop out and go get a job because they're like, oh, six dollars now wasn't worth it, but 725 is worth it, right? I, maybe there are kids on the margin that think that or something like that. Right? For whatever reason, we're increasing the supply of workers. Okay. So when I have a 
price floor that's above the equilibrium, I get something that is called labor surplus, right? I get a surplus of labor. Because now 400 people are demanded. The firms want to hire only 400. They used to want to hire 500, but now they only want to use to hire now they only want to hire 400. They used to want to hire 500, but now they now people 550 people want to work. Okay? We have a labor surplus. What's it called when people want a job but can't get one? Unemployment, okay? So we're going to say that this binding constraint causes unemployment, if that makes sense. The binding constraint causes unemployment. Okay. So I went ahead and changed this to unemployment. I went ahead and changed the price floor to minimum wage, right? Because that's, these are the words that we use in real life, right? Um, so basically, what, what, what does the minimum wage do? What's, so far, what's the only thing that it's done? It's created unemployment, right? The other thing technically it did do was there are 400 people here who are still working and they're getting paid more. So guess what? For these 400 people, <laughs> they like this minimum wage, right? The 400 people who have jobs, right? But who's the minimum wage not good for? The 100 people, or the 150 people, I mean, that don't have a job. Okay, so here's something to think about. Who do minimum wage laws affect? People working the minimum wage, <laughs> exactly, good, yeah, right? Does it affect, uh, you know, businessmen, or is, is it gonna affect me, right? Is it gonna affect uh, people making a lot of money, highly skilled workers, no, right? The only people that get any effect at all from the minimum wage are the people who are working, you know, the, at the really low, at the really low skill levels. Okay, these are generally, I mean, the minimum wage, these these low paying jobs are generally like originally intended for like I don't know high schoolers during the summer or something of that nature because high schoolers, people without bachelor's degrees yet, they don't have all of the skills just because they're not old enough yet, but we want them to get experience, right? So clearly they're not worth a ton of money they're, per hour, they're worth a lower amount of money, but they still need experience, so both employers are happy to hire them and students are happy to have the job because they need the experience, right? So that, that's, that's, that's the idea here. So these kind of, uh, the, the youth or the low skill people um, are, are, are mostly the ones that are affected, right? The, te the teens, because it's the, the original people for whom these jobs are mostly uh, mostly created. Here's a study. So the question, you should be saying, well, that's pretty crazy. Does minimum wage actually make teen unemployment? Well, actually it does. Uh, studies are, have shown that a 10% increase in the minimum wage raises teen unemployment by one to 3%. Right. Okay. So this is crazy because it probably really affects you guys right here, thinking about getting summer employment or part-time jobs, right? Whereas these part-time, or excuse me, these minimum wage laws seem attractive because, oh hey, I'm going to be able to get more paid more if I get a part-time job. It makes it much, much, much more difficult to get a part-time job. Does that make sense? Um. And there, there's, there's a number, of, and, and this, this makes sense. There's a number of ways to explain this. For example, say that I'm a firm, say that I'm, I don't know, Subway, and I'm forced now, instead of paying $6 an hour, or whatever they pay, they, they definitely pay minimum wage, I'm forced to pay $15 an hour to a worker, right? I'm thinking at $15 an hour, I can get like an adult. <laughs> I can get someone who I know is responsible. I don't have to worry about getting, uh, teenagers anymore, right? I can get my, what do they call the people who work at Subway? Sandwich artists, I think. I'm going to hire a sandwich artist that's responsible and I know is always going to show up because for $15 an hour, uh, I, can, I can buy a whole lot more. Does that make sense? So all of this, the kiddos, the students who wanted to work at Subway no longer have, have the ability to work there. Does that make sense? Um, and so, so that's, that's kind of the idea between how, why it's... Uh, why it causes unemployment among, amongst just the lower levels of the skill spectrum. 
OK. Let's do this, and then, uh, and then we'll take a break, OK? We're going to look at the market for hotel rooms. All right. And what's, what's going on here is we have a supply curve. We have a demand curve. We have price of hotel rooms, quantity of hotel rooms. This is not the labor market. So we're back in the regular interpretation of things, right? P is price. The demanders are the households, the people who want to buy hotel rooms. The suppliers are the hotel room factories. I guess we'll call those hotels, right? OK. So what I want you to do is determine the effects of a $90 price ceiling, a $90 price floor, a $100, $20 price floor. In each case, OK, so I need you to draw three supply and demand graphs. Okay, one for A, one for B, one for C. In each case, I need you to tell me the original equilibrium and then the change equilibrium. Okay? The original equilibrium and the change equilibrium. That's how you tell me the effects. Okay? Okay, good. Then uh, since they're already in your notes, just draw in the price ceilings and price floors. You still need to tell me the old and the new equilibria though. Okay? Just a hint, make sure you think about whether the price control is binding or not binding before you tell me the effect. That's the first step. We have to check if it's binding or not. One of these is not binding. All right. Let's do this. $90 price ceiling. So first step, draw in that price ceiling right at 90, right? OK. What's the original? Uh, what's the original equilibrium? The original equilibrium price and quantity. A hundred rooms and a hundred dollars, right? In the world with no government interference at all, we have a hundred dollars a room and a hundred rooms sold, right? Hundred dollars a room, hundred rooms sold. Now let's, let's suppose this is uh, Las Vegas, right? There's a lot of hotel rooms up there. Um, they, the Las Vegas Tourism Board decides, hey, we could get more people if we lower the price of hotel rooms and made them cheaper, and then we can get more you know, Southern Californians to come up here and have hotel rooms. Right? That's the thought. Okay? So they institute a price ceiling of 90. What does this do to the supply of hotel rooms? Decreases it to 90. What does it do to the number of demanders? Clearly increases it, right? Yes. More people drove up from Southern California to uh, spend the night at, in the Las Vegas hotel room, right? However, not as many hotel rooms can be sold. Now, we can think of this a couple of ways. Maybe one, like in the long run, hotels can't afford to build new rooms or something like that. So that's why the, the supply falls down. As old rooms decay, they can't afford to fix them. So the number of su the, the supply falls. Maybe. Um, it costs, for like some rooms, it costs more in like housekeeping and, and all that upkeep and stuff like that than, than they wouldn't get it at $90 a night. So they just don't even rent those rooms. For some reason, the supply falls, OK? So when the price falls to 90, buyers are demanding 130 or 120, but they can only supply 90 of them. So there's what's called a shortage. Binding price constraint is what I was looking for. But yeah, it causes a shortage, right? The binding price ceiling causes a shortage. Um, let me ask you. So the, the old equilibrium was here. Where's the new equilibrium at? This is kind of a trick question. So the new equilibrium, which is how much, what is the price and quantity of hotel rooms sold now? Where, what point on there is that graph? It's, only, it's a single point. It's 90-90, right? Why is it not here? Yeah. There, I mean, this could be a point if there was 120 hotel rooms out there, but there's not 120 hotel rooms, right? The actual number of hotel rooms that are being turned over is right here at 90-90. Does that make sense? Clearly, society is worse off at this point overall, right? I mean, for these 90 people who they, were, they used to be buying a hotel room right here at 100, right? And now they get to pay $90. For them, they're better off, right? And for those 90 people, they're pretty stoked. But then there's all these people between 90 and 100 that couldn't afford it or couldn't find a hotel room, so they couldn't get one. And they're not happy. And then there's all these new people, the 
20 new people who drove up from California, uh, Southern California looking for a hotel room and can't find one either, right? So overall, they're worse off, okay? The binding price ceiling causes a shortage. Okay, let's do a $90 price floor. Okay, $90 price floor. So, I mean, the line looks exactly the same, right? Price ceiling, now, now we got a price floor. But price floors do something different than price ceiling. What does a price floor do? It's the minimum, right? So they say, hey, you can do anything above the floor, but anything below it is not OK. OK, so the government institutes a price floor saying, hey, uh, at least $90 a hotel room you have to sell it for, right? Let's say the government instituted this. Who would they try be trying to help here if they said you have to sell your hotel rooms at least for $90? You can sell them for more, for like a minimum hotel room price. They're probably not trying to help buyers because they're saying like you can't make it cheap for the buyers even if you wanted to. They're trying to help the sellers out, right? Whereas go back, go back a slide. The ninety dollar price ceiling, they're trying to help who? The buyers, right? The people who, who are coming up. They're, they're trying to. Um, but the price floor is probably trying to aid sellers, right? But this price floor is set. Uh, is it is it binding or not binding? not binding, right? It's not binding. Because the price floor says everything down here is the Ill illegal zone. That's hard for me to say. Everything up here you can do. And the, and the equilibrium is like, hey, yeah, we're above the, the price floor. So it's a worthless law, right? It has no effect. That makes sense to everybody? That was B. And what was C? Oh, by the way, yeah, the price and quantity stay. Right? The equilibrium, no change in equilibrium. <coughs> Okay, 120 price floor. So price floor is now above the equilibrium, right? So is this binding or not binding? Price floor is above the equilibrium. It's binding, right? Where does the marketplace want to be at? Here. Where is it being forced to be at? Up here at 120. Right? The price floor is pushing it up. Everything below the price floor is illegal. Everything above it is OK. OK? So the, the price rises to 120. Buyers demand only 60 hotel rooms. Right? Because at 120, nobody's driving up there to Las Vegas because it's too expensive. So we only have 60 people who want to buy a hotel room. But the hotels, they're like, oh man, we can make bank. We can make a lot of profit off of this higher price. So they want to sell 120 of them. What is that called when there's more available? It's a surplus, right? So there's extra, oops, there's extra hotel rooms out there. There are extra hotel rooms out there. The old equilibrium was at where? 100 to 100. The new equilibrium is where? 120 and 60. Does everybody see that? Why is it not there? Yeah, exactly. So you have to do the place where, where there are demanders for the supply, right? Right here, there's a ton of hotel rooms that are available to be sold, but nobody buying them, right? Here is how many are being actually purchased, right? So the new equilibrium here is $120 and 60 quantity. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, any questions? Now that we've learned about the two main types of price controls, which are what are the two main types that government can control the price? Price ceiling, price floors. Very good. OK. So that number, that's two of the three co concepts we're going to talk about. The third one is taxes, but we're not quite there yet. We're going to ask, right, how, how, does, how does this help the marketplace, right? Does it make the marketplace turn out for better or for worse? We kind, I kind of gave you hints along the way, right, about like, oh, hey, this causes un unemployment, or this causes a surplus, or something like that, right? So you kind of have an idea how price controls do work. But remember one of the 10 principles from chapter one, right? Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity, meaning markets by themselves. Markets not with government in intrusion. Right? That's the, that's the point of this. It's better when we let the market decide the price, right? when we let the, the, the equilibrium price, or in this case equilibrium wage, be as the market determines, and we don't let the government try to change the price. Okay? It's better off when we don't do that. That's what, that's, it's usually better off when we don't do that. Okay? And so why? 
Because prices are the signals that guide the allocation of society's resources, right? Prices are the signal that tells people, oh, hey, that I want to buy this product now, or no, I shouldn't buy this product. It's too expensive for me. It's also the signal that firms use to decide how much they're going to produce, right? And so when policymakers change prices, then the information that is usually in price is messed up. Right? Prices, they, they like to say that prices contain all of the information that you need for that marketplace. Maybe it's an overly bold claim, but the idea is there, there's a lot of information in the price. Okay? And so the other thing that we saw, that price controls are often intended to help which people? The poorer people, right? The lower skilled people, the people working for minimum wage, the people who can't hardly afford a, an apartment. Right? But it ends up actually, sometimes it can create unemployment a lot at those places, and it also creates people who can't get a house, right? So you tried to help people get a higher wage and get a house for cheaper. Really, what you ended up doing is you made them unemployed and you made the, them not have any houses available. OK. All right, now let's go to that number three, taxes. Everybody get this last slide? Did I go too fast? OK. Taxes. Uh, this is the third way that governments can intrude on, upon the, gov the uh, marketplace. And it's by far the most common. You guys are used to this all the time, right? What does the government do? It levies taxes. The word You guys need to know, learn this word if you don't know it. Levy, L-E-V-Y. It means to impose a tax or to charge a tax. Okay on many goods and services. And what does it use? It, it uses the money it gets as revenue to pay for national defense or public schools, any sort of public goods, right? Things that the individuals don't pay for, roads. So the government has a choice, right? They can make buyers or sellers pay the tax. If I go right now to uh, the store and I buy a shirt, who pays the tax? Here, here, in America. Yeah, the, who's we? The, the buyers, right? Exactly. Right? I go to the store, and then on my receipt, it says, like, you know, my shirt was maybe $16.99, and then it says, like, $1.78 in tax, right? And I pay all of that money to the, the store, maybe to Ross, right? And then at the end of the day, Ross turns around, and all those little amounts that, that we paid for the tax, they send it off to the government, right? Everybody knows how that works? So... It's like I'm writing a check to the government, right? But I'm actually just paying the money to Ross, and then they're paying it to the government for me. Mm -hmm. So there's there's no sales tax at all, actually, in a couple of states. I mean, Oregon might be one of them. I can't remember, but I, I take your word for it. So basically, the, there's just no sales tax at all. Uh, the government gets its money from other other ways. Does that make sense? So nobody ends up paying it. Okay. This is just something that we're paying to the government in order that the government can have revenue to, you know, do stuff, to, to, to be a government. Okay. So we're going to analyze whether the buyers or the sellers pay the tax. Um, what's an example of a seller paying the tax? I can't think of one right now. But if you could just imagine, like, I don't know, you go to the pizza shop. And then there's a dollar tax on the pizza or something like that. And the government charges the pizza joint a dollar for selling. Something like that. Right? So I guess any, any kind of marketplace where you have to think about where like maybe you have to get a permit to sell a good or something like that, that's kind of like the, the seller paying the tax. Right? It's not as common in America. Sometimes, sometimes I drive by like a furniture store or a new car dealer or something, and they're like, if you buy it right now, we'll pay the tax. Have you guys ever seen that? Maybe something like that. That's the only kind of example I can think of that's the selfish pay with that. OK. Um, this tax can be a percentage of the goods price. Like here, like in Orange County, it's like maybe nine and a quarter or something like that percent of the price. Or it can be a specific amount for each unit sold. Uh, we're going to just, for the purposes of this class, pretend that taxes are just like a dollar per unit. We're not going to have like a percentage tax. OK, does that make sense? It's, it's the exact same, because in real life, it, it, generally most taxes are a percentage of the price, right? I owe like 10% or 6%, something like that. Um, just a little more mathematically difficult, 
we're just going to assume that every tax is just x dollars per unit, right? So, so whether the pizza is sold for one dollar or five hundred dollars, there's still a tax of two dollars, for example. Okay, we call that a per unit tax. Okay, um, let's do this pizza, shall we? Okay, so the market for pizza. We have price of pizza, quantity of pizza, we have the suppliers of pizza, and the demanders of pizza. Who's the demanders? I don't know, households, people who want pizza. Who are the suppliers of pizza? The firms, right? Okay. So equilibrium, we arrive at $10 per pizza, and they sell 500 pizzas total, right? $10 per pizza and $500 pizzas, 500 pizzas total. Um, Let's suppose that the government imposes a $1.50 tax per pizza. Okay. Again, this is a little different from real life because in real life, if I go to Pizza Hut and I buy a pizza, I pay a percentage tax, right? Like it's some percentage of my total sales price. That's it's way easier. Let's just pretend it's a dollar fifty tax per pizza. Okay. And we're gonna make the buyers pay it. This is just like it is here in America, right? I go to the, I go to Pizza Hut and I have to pay dollar fifty tax for the for the pizza. Okay, so here's what you need to think about. Think you're you're thinking the people who are paying the tax are the buyers, right? So imagine put yourself in the in the feet of the buyer. It's like at any price that's on the menu, I'm actually paying a dollar fifty more than that, right? Because I have to write a check to the government at the end of the day. Okay, so any price that is any uh, anything that's on the menu, any price that they decide to choose to sell me, I have to pay a dollar fifty more than that. Okay, so what does that do? Basically, that means that if I were to still buy five hundred pizzas, if if we still wanted to make everybody pay five buy five hundred pizzas, I can't charge them ten dollars. How much could I charge them total? Eight fifty, right? So let's drop that point down to eight fifty. Because they'll only pay ten dollars total, the demanders, right? So if they're going to have to pay a dollar fifty to the government at the end of the day, I can only charge them eight fifty and make them buy five hundred pizzas. Does that make sense? This is true at every point along the demand curve. If I just drop every point along the demand curve by the amount of the tax, it's like I get this new demand curve. Let's call it demand two. This new demand curve. Okay. So this is the demand curve that like represents the amount that the pizza joints can charge, the pizza factories can charge, right? The, 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 the consumers, the people are still actually paying D1, their original demand curve, right? But what's the amount that they're willing to pay to the pizza joint, the pizza factory, the pizza firm? They're willing to pay this D2. Basically, all I've done is I've subtracted out $1.50 tax because I know that they're not they're going to have to pay $1.50 tax no matter what, so I just shift that demand curve down uh, by $1.50. Okay. How come some places don't tell you the tax until you get to the register? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know. It's, I think one thing, tax rates do change, maybe not all the time, maybe like once every year or two they can change. Um, but I think that maybe they don't want you to think about, I mean, if you're trying to sell something to someone, you don't want them to think about the extra tax they're going to pay, <laughs> right? You just want them to think about your price. Makes it look cheaper, maybe, yeah. Right, right. No, it's very common in other countries. Like, they either will have just the, like, for example, I, when I go to England, like, there's a price. And then at the bottom it says, including VAT, they call there's the value added tax, the VAT. Then it just has the price with a tax on, on, the, on the same whatever price tag. So that's kind of nice. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. So yeah, I think the idea that is that they just want to try to make it look cheaper. OK. But at any rate, let's pretend that the buyers know what the tax is at all times. So <laughs> The, the, the price on the thing is reflective of including tax, right? We have, to, we have to make the buyers have full information here. Basically, what they're saying is they're, the, they're only willing to pay up to D2 to the pizza joint because they know that at whatever they pay, they're going to have to pay $1.50 more to the government, which will take them back to their original demand curve. Okay, you understand how we analyze this? So uh, if, 
if, if price falls from $10 to $8.50, for example, buyers are still willing to purchase the 500 pizzas. Okay, so now we have a new, like a quasi new demand curve, right? This demand curve is still the actual real demand curve, but this is the demand curve that the firms are, like that between the firms and the buyers, okay? So what's the new equilibrium gonna be? Where is it at? The two newest curves, right? These two right here. So we have a new equilibrium. Quantity is 450 pizzas, okay? And uh, now the price, this is a little, this is, where the prices get a little bit weird. Remember, this is the curve between the demand curve between the firms and the buyers, right? So this point right here is the amount that the between the firms and the buyers. We're gonna call this PS. This is the price that the buyers pay to the seller. So at the end of the day, the seller gets nine dollars and fifty cents. Okay? At that point. However, is the buyer done paying? No. They paid $9.50 for a pizza to the pizza joint, but what do they have to then go pay? It's, a dollar, it's like a dollar fifty tax, right? Let's pretend at the end of the day they just write a check to the government, just to make it easier, okay? So how much does the buyer actually total pay, totally pay? If they're paying $9.50 to the pizza joint, how much are they paying in total? Is that $11 or something like that, right? $9.50 plus $1.50 will take us to $11. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna label that PB, which is at the end of the day, this is the price the buyers pay, PB. PS is at the end of the day, this is the price the sellers get, we'll call that PS. The distance between PB and PS is what? Why are they different? Why is PB higher than PS? Why is the buyer paying more than what the seller is getting? There's this thing called a tax, right? And remember, it's very convenient. How much did we shift down the demand curve by? $1.50, whatever the tax is, right? So if I'm at this point and I wanna know how much the, they're gonna pay including the tax, I just go back up to the old demand curve, right? Because I shifted it down by the amount of the tax. So if I wanna include the tax back, I just go back up. Does that make sense? So I can go back up to uh, $11 and I get my price of the buyer. So in the case of taxes, remember how I said an equilibrium only always includes two pieces, the price and the quantity? Well here, it's a little bit weird. It includes the quantity and it includes two different prices, an equilibrium in the taxes situation, okay? And that's because the price the buyer pays is different than the price the sellers get. Everybody understand that part? It's kind of confusing, okay? So the difference between the, the price the buyers pay and the price the sellers get to keep at the end of the day is the tax, $1.50. Okay? So as, as to be expected, I guess, if you impose a tax on buyers, they're not going to buy as much. Right? How much did quantity drop from 500 to 450? That's the law of demand, right? If we make things more expensive, people are going to buy fewer products. Okay? So. Let's, let's define now the incidence of a tax. Remember earlier uh, in this class, I said the incidence is like how much people are hurt by the tax. That's the key here, okay? This isn't the people who are writing the check to the government at the end of the day. Because who are the people who are writing the check to the government at the end of the day? The, the buyers in this example. It was the buyers, remember? The buyers are paying $1.50 to the government, okay? So regardless of anything else, we're, the buyers are writing a check to the government. Another way to say that is the government levies a tax on buyers. That's another way to say that. So we have our econ speak down, okay? So the buyer, the government levies a tax on buyers, meaning the buyers are the one that have to send a, che send a check to the government at the end of the day. Is it true that only buyers are hurt, harmed by the tax? No. Let's look and see who's harmed by the tax. It's pretty easy to see, right? So in our example, how much more do buyers pay than they originally? Right, a dollar more. So how much, are, how much are the buyers hurt by the tax? In other words, what is the incidence of the tax that is borne by the buyer? A dollar, right? The buyers are hurt a dollar by the tax, right? What about the sellers? They used to make how much per pizza? $10, and now they're only making how much? 950. So the sellers are actually hurt as well. Do you guys see this? The sellers are hurt by how much? Another way to say that, let me ask econ speak here. 
What's the incidence of the tax that is borne by the seller? The answer to that is 50 cents, right? So this is super important to realize. Just because the buyer is writing the check to the government at the end of the day does not mean that the buyer is the only one that gets hurt by the tax. Does that make sense? Both the buyer and the seller are hurt by the tax. Who's the person upon whom the tax is levied? Make sure you guys have this econ speak down. The tax is levied upon whom? The buyer, right? But the incidence, right, is share, shared by both the buyer and the seller. Everybody understand that? It's a lot of complicated terminology and jargon, but you got to, got to get it down, or else you won't understand my question on the test. Okay, so that basically remember this outcome, please. Remember this: buyers are paying 11, sellers are paying 950, and 450 pizzas are getting sold. This is the world where the buyers pay the check to the government. Now let's switch worlds. Let's go ahead and pretend that the people who pay the check to the government are the sellers. Let's just see what happens, right? Maybe because this is, go back to this other one, this is kind of a bummer, right? We're losing out 50, 50 customers that were getting pizza are not getting, are not getting pizza, right? They're having to all pay a dollar more, which is sad. These people are making 50 cents less, which is sad. Maybe there's a better way to tax this market, right? Because this is kind of hurting the market a little bit. You guys see that? What if we tax sellers, right? So we know that if we make buyers pay more, the law of demand says that they're going to buy less. So that's why we had the reduction in quantity. Maybe if we make buyers Pay, or excuse me, maybe if we make sellers pay the check to the government at the end of the day for the tax, maybe it'll be better. Let's check it out, okay? So here's our original equilibrium at $10, 500 pizzas, and here's our original supply curve. Now, $1.50 per unit tax on sellers, how are we going to analyze that? Well, basically, what it does is it, it raises the cost to the seller by $1.50. Does that make sense? It's like for the seller, instead of paying for you know wages and tortilla, not tortillas, uh, pizza dough and uh, pizza sauce and cheese and all those things, right? Instead of paying for that, they also now have to pay $1.50 in tax, right? So it's like it got more expensive. It costs more for the sellers to sell a pizza. So how do we interpret that? Well, basically, in other words, what we have to think of is that in order to make the seller still willing to sell 500 pizzas, how much do I actually have to pay them per pizza now? It's not $10 per pizza. I have to pay them how much per pizza now? $11.50. Does everybody understand that? Because I know the seller, at the end of the day, needs to get $10, and then they're going to make 500 pizzas. If they also have to pay a tax of $1.50, then in order to sell 500 pizzas, they have to get $10 to themselves. If they also have to pay $1.50, you're going to have to pay the seller $1.50 more. So you're going to have to pay the seller $11.50 in order to uh, encourage them to make 500 pizzas. Does that make sense? All right. It is true that at any point along the supply curve, you actually have to pay them $1.50 more. Does everybody understand that? At every point along the supply curve. So what we do is we just draw a new supply curve that's been shifted up, which is the same thing as you know, demand shifting, or excuse me, supply shifting down. Remember, this is a decrease in supply. It's a decrease in supply. Uh, the supply curve shifts up by $1.50 at every price point. OK? So this is kind of similar to the way we incorporated the tax on the buyers. Now, this is the tax on the sellers. Supply curve moves up at every point by the amount of the tax. Questions there? All right. So where is our new equilibrium? Remember, we just always use the two newest curves, right? The two newest curves are these points right here, right? OK, so we have an equilibrium here at this point. There it is. Quantity is 450. And the price that the buyers have to pay them is $11. Right? This is the price that the, this is the price uh, that the buyers are paying to the sellers is eleven dollars. But do the sellers at the end of the day keep eleven dollars? No, because who's paying the tax here? 
sellers. So at the end of the day, how much does the seller get to keep? 950, right? How, how can I find that easily? Well, I know that the difference between these two supply curves is the amount of the tax. So I can just take this point and I just drop it to the old supply curve, and that'll be the difference of the tax. So I do that, and the price the seller gets to um, keep is $9.50. Okay, that makes sense. The difference between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller gets to keep is obviously the amount of the tax. Because at the end of the day, the seller just writes a check to the government for the tax. That makes sense. What do you notice? What do you notice specifically about this number and this number and this number? It's 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 all the same as when the buyers were paying the tax, right? Whoa, this is interesting. Whether the buyer pays the check or whether the seller pays the check at the end of the day, it's exact same. The outcome is the same in both cases. This is pretty crazy, right? And it's extremely important for you guys to understand, right? Does it matter if the government levies a tax on the buyer versus a seller? No. It doesn't matter who pays the check at the end of the day. Okay? The outcome is the same in both cases. All right? So the effects on the price and the quantity, the tax incidents are the same whether the tax is imposed on buyers or sellers. Really important. Yes, sir? Why do they tax the buyers? Well, the, the, I guess the way to answer that is why does it matter? They could either tax the buyer or the seller. And it, it doesn't. It, it economically, it doesn't matter, right? Maybe it's easier to tax buyers because if you tax sellers, maybe they're bigger and more coordinated, and they can complain to Congress easier, and it's just a bigger hassle, something like that. Maybe it's just easier to tax the buyers. But really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It does not matter. Okay. Um, what matters is this. Okay. And here's the way that I want you guys to analyze taxes. I don't want you to worry about whether the question says the tax is placed on the buyers or placed on the sellers. I don't want you to worry about it at all. I don't actually want you to shift the supply and demand curves like I showed you, because that's just a waste of time, because the outcome is going to be the same, right? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look and find the height of the tax. right? And remember, this is in, this is in dollars, right? So down here somewhere, you can go from between 0 and $1.50. You can find how tall $1.50 is, right? You can find how tall the tax is. All I want you to do is slide it in to the original supply and demand curve until it hits. Does that make sense? I'm going to call that the tax wedge. Okay. Again, here's how you do it. You find over here on the, on the P axis, because it's in dollars, the height of the tax. In this case, $1.50. And you put your fingers that far apart, and you slide them in until you hit the original supply and demand curve. That's called the tax wedge. And then where your, top, your finger hits, that's the price the buyers pay. Where your thumb hits down on the bottom, that's the price the sellers get. And it's super simple. You see, you can do these tax problems. And it seems complicated, but you can actually do them in like two seconds if you just remember the tax wedge trick. Okay? So that's how I want you guys to analyze taxes, um, just because it's easier. Okay. Uh, notice also when the buyers and the sellers pay the tax, either the buyers or the sellers, the people who are hurt by the tax it stays the same in both cases. Always, the, the buyers are hurt a dollar by the tax, and the sellers are hurt 50 cents by the tax. Isn't that interesting? The buyers are always hurt a dollar by the tax. The sellers are always hurt 50 cents by the tax. And it doesn't matter if the buyers write the check or the sellers write the check to the government at the end of the day. OK? That's what this key is here is. The tax incidence, meaning how much they're hurt, is the same whether the tax is imposed on the buyers or the sellers. OK, so a couple inter uh, important points. One, it's the same whether buyers or sellers pay the tax. Two, the incidence is not determined by who, pay, who buys and sells or who pays the tax, it's determined by the distance 
between the new PS and the old price. And finally, the easy way to do taxes is just with the tax wedge. So don't even worry about all the, those slides I taught you about moving supply and demand curves. Unless I ask you to, to move a supply and demand curve, then you need to, right? But if I just ask you to find the, the effects of a tax, just do the tax wedge. OK. So suppose the government imposes a tax on buyers of $30 per room. OK. So right away, this is a super perfect uh, candidate for the tax wedge, right? You just put your fingers apart so there's like $30 apart, right? And then you just slide it in until it hits. OK, that's the way you would do the tax wedge. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to find the new equilibrium in the world of taxes. Remember, the equilibrium is now three pieces. It's the quantity and the price, but there's two prices. OK? And then also find the incidence of the tax, meaning who is hurt by the tax. OK? And how much is the buyer's hurt? How much is the seller's hurt? OK, ready, go. Remember, if you can find, you know, any amount here that's $30 apart, that's find the $30 tax wedge, and slide it on in here so it hits. And that'll tell you your new equilibrium with a tax. The equilibrium without the tax is pretty easy to find. All right, let's check this out. So what's the original equilibrium? Again, this is the same example. I've used it like 100 times in this class already. 100, 100, right? OK. Uh, how tall is the tax? $30, right? So I just went and I just found, I don't know, between 60 and 90. That's $30, right? I just put my fingers apart that far. I slid it in until it hits. It's pretty simple. Slid it in until it hits. That's my tax, $30, OK? Now, what's the new quantity? 80. And what's the new PB? And what's the new PS? Uh huh. Why is why are the buyers paying more than the sellers get? This is kind of easy question. Because of because of the tax, right? Exactly. Tax. Does it matter who pays the tax at the end of the day to the government? No, it doesn't matter at all, right? The buyers might send the check. The sellers might send the check. We're going to have this exact same outcome every time, right? Um, what's the incidence of the tax? Who's harmed by the tax, and how much are they harmed? Okay, so how much are buyers hurt by? Ten dollars. And how did you figure that out? They used to pay hundred. Now they're paying one hundred and ten. They're like, ah, that sucks. I'm being hurt by ten dollars. Okay, who? What's the incidence that the sell of this tax on the sellers? Twenty dollars. How did we find that? They used to get hundred dollars per hotel room. Now they're only getting eighty dollars per hotel room. Does that make sense? Okay. So there you go. Incidents, the buyers are hurt $10 and the sellers are hurt $20. Okay. And that's just the sellers who are the the buyers and sellers who are in here still. Here's another thing that kind of happens with taxes, and we'll talk about this in a second. There used to be a hundred hotel rooms bought and sold, right? Which meant that there were a hundred people buying and a hundred people selling them. When the tax happened, the quantity dropped down to 80, right? That means that these 20 people along right here, these 20 people, don't get a hotel room anymore. That means that these 20 firms don't get to sell a hotel room anymore, right? So there's a lot more like hurt that's incorporated in this economy than just this incidence, just so you know, OK? We'll talk about that in a little bit. And there's a lot more like bad stuff that's happening to the economy. OK. so. Uh, Let's ask the question, though, before we go to that, let's ask the question, why is it that sellers are hurt more than buyers here? You see that? How in this example, sellers are hurt more than buyers? In the pizza example, it was the opposite, right? I think buyers were hurt a dollar and sellers were hurt 50 cents, right? So why is it sometimes the buyers hurt more? That's just, that is to say, why does the buyer pay, bear the incidence sometimes more often? And sometimes, why does the seller bear the incidence more, than, more of the incidence than, of the tax than the buyer, right? So let's ask. Uh, and, and the key here is elasticity, which we learned last chapter, right? The key is the elasticity. Who, who is hurt more? Let's imagine that supply is more elastic than demand. Supply is more elastic than the demand. That means that supply is more price sensitive than demand, OK? So what does that mean? Which curve is going to be steeper? 
So as it gets flatter and flatter, that's more and more elastic, right? As it gets steeper and steeper, that's less elastic, right? Right. So, so if demand is inelastic, supply is elastic, then demand is going to be steep and supply is going to be flat, something like that. Does that make sense? OK, so let's draw those. There's demand that's steep, and there's supply that's flatter. OK? So you see I've drawn it so that supply is flatter, meaning more elastic. Demand is steeper, meaning less elastic. OK? Let's go ahead and do uh, calculate just a pretend tax. OK? So there's the price if there's no tax, yes? Now let's go ahead and drive the tax wedge in. It doesn't matter how much it is, any tax wedge, boom. Who's hurt more by the tax? Just look at it real quick. Who's hurt more by the tax? The demanders are, right? Because look, this is the price they used to pay. The demanders, the buyers, their price went up a bunch, right? Their incidence of the tax is huge. The suppliers, hardly any, OK? So the idea here is that the buyer's share is big and the seller's share is small. Okay, um, so the, so in this case, supply is more elastic. Supply has a smaller tax burden, right? In this case, it's good to be elastic. You see that? It's good to be elastic. Let's see if that's always the case. Let's suppose that. Oh, and let's talk about why first of all. Why do sellers pay less tax? Well, remember when supply is elastic, that means it's very easy for supply to change their quantity, right? So sellers, it's very easy for them to say, nope, I'm not making this product anymore because it's just too much taxes, right? But the buyers, they're inelastic. What does that mean that if they're inelastic? It means they like need the product no matter what the price, right? So if the tax comes, who's going to be hit more by it? The people who need the product, right? Because the sellers, they're just like, nah, I'm not going to sell it. It's just, it's just too much of a hassle for me. I'm out of this marketplace, right? So the sellers have the advantage. They're more elastic, so they pay less. This, the, the, the demanders, steeper demand curve. That means they need the product. Maybe it's a necessity. They're going to be stuck with the tax. That's the idea there, OK? Now, let's imagine that demand is more elastic than supply, OK? So which? Curve is going to be flatter. Which curve is going to be flatter? Demand, right? Because flatter means more elasticity. Okay, so there's a pretty flat demand, and then supply is going to be pretty steep, right? Okay, so there's a pretty steep supply. Now let's go ahead and uh, calculate the tax wedge. So that's the original price. Let's get the tax wedge. Boom, we slide it on in there. Who's hurt more this time? The sellers are, right? Because look, the sellers lose that much. The buyers only have to pay that much more, right? So there's PB, there's PS. The buyer's share of the tax, the seller's share of the tax. Okay. Now why is it that the case this time it's the opposite? Sellers are the ones that are hit harder. Why is that? Demand is more elastic. In other words, if a tax comes into the marketplace, the demanders, remember, they're like, I'm out of here. I'm not, I'm not buying anymore, or I'm going to buy fewer of them because I'm very elastic, right? I can move my quantity a lot. The seller, maybe they just like, they've only made a certain amount and they're stuck in the market and they have to be there until all their products are sold, right? Then that's very inelastic. So you're going to have a very steep supply curve, okay? So once again, it's good to be elastic. It's good to be elastic in terms of taxes, right? So it's easier for buyers and sellers to leave the market. So then sellers are stuck and they have to bear the burden of the tax. The lesson here with who, who's hurt more by the tax, who bears more incidence of the tax, it's good to be elastic. It's good to be elastic. All right. OK, so here's an example. Who pays the luxury tax? 
You guys know what the luxury tax is? In 1990, Congress adopted a luxury tax on expensive things. Okay, It's kind of similar to the luxury tax. I think the NBA teams pay if they're over a certain amount. But anyways. Uh, why did they do that? Why did Congress pay a luxury tax? Or make people start paying a luxury tax? Right. The, the reasoning was what? Uh, if you're buying a yacht, you can probably afford to cough up a couple of extra tax dollars to the government. That's the idea, right? So Congress, they're, I mean, they're not idiots. They're ed apparently well-educated people. I don't know. But in uh, 1990, they thought this. They're like, we need a, couple, a little bit more revenue, so we need a way to charge the richer people who can afford to pay more tax to pay more tax. So they're like, oh, we'll just tax expensive things like yachts and private airplanes and expensive cars and that sort of thing, right? But let's look and see who's really paying this tax, right? The, the Congress maybe forgot to check their supply and demand di diagram. Let's check this out, OK? So Congress said that the goal was to raise revenue from those who could afford it. But the question is, who's really paying the tax, right? Who is hurt more by the tax, right? That's the question. I'm not asking you who writes the check to the government at the end of the day. Because does it matter who writes the check to the government at the end of the day? No. What we're interested in is who is really hurt more by the tax, right? Because we want these wealthy consumers to get hurt more, to, to, to be able to pay more to the government, right? OK, let's look at the market for yachts. Let's imagine what the supply and the demand curves look like, OK? So demand, first of all, yachts. What kind of good are they? <laughs> a luxury good. What do we know about the elasticity of luxury goods? Very elastic, which means I'm going to draw a pretty flat demand curve, right? This is pretty elastic. Now, imagine that you are a yacht factory, yacht seller, something like that, right? How elastic are you? You're probably not elastic. You probably can only make one yacht at a time, and you probably have contracts for many years, right? Like uh, you write a contract with someone, okay, I'll build you a boat, and it takes a couple of years to do it, right? So yacht builders are probably very inelastic, meaning they can't change the quantity of yachts. So let's go ahead and draw a uh, very steep supply curve, okay? Let's imagine that. Now, the original equilibrium is here. Whoops. The original equilibrium is there without any tax. That was before tax. And then Congress is like, let's go ahead and tax the wealthy people. And they probably even thought, you know what? I'm going to make the wealthy people be the ones that pay the check to the government at the end of the day. Right? They probably even thought that much through because they wanted to charge the wealthy people. Right? But let's look at this. Let's slide the tax wedge in there. Price the buyer pays. Price the seller gets. Who pays more? of the tax, actually. Sellers. Very interesting. Did you guys see that? The idea was to try to get the money from the uh, wealthy consumers, but really they're getting money from whom? The sellers, the luxury, the, the yacht builders. Oops, right? They forgot to check their economics. OK? So it's just an interesting little example of a time in real life when, uh, when Maybe somebody didn't check their supply and demand diagram very well. All right. Everybody understand how that works out? OK. Um, let's do this uh, problem together, and then because we're almost done. Um, and I will help you through this one. So in 2011, there was a payroll tax cut. Right. So for those of you who don't know, I work. And then the coastline pays me, right? But then of my salary, coastline has to pay something like, uh, well, before 2011, coastline has to pay 6.2% to Social Security. And then uh, uh, I have to pay 6.2%, right? So like, let's say I get paid $1,000, right? I only get whatever 6% of $1,000 is. Maybe $940 or something like that, right? Because the other $60 goes. On top of that, Cosine has to pay $60 okay? to, to the government. So there's 12.4% being paid, right? But the thought was, 
pay. Um, for this tax, is an interesting tax. Both the buyer is sending a check to the government, right? Because it's I'm getting it's getting taken out of my pay, and the seller, uh, or the 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 coastline and me are both sending checks to the government, and we're splitting it half and half. Okay, and so in this case, this is an example of the labor market, right? So demand here is coastline. They're demanding my labor. I'm supplying it. This is Justin. Right? And there's a tax. Let's just draw the tax wedge in there. And it's being it's being split half and half. OK? Um, and then in, in 2011, well, the, the, the bill was written, the, ta the law was written in 2010, but it went into effect in 2011. That said, oh, this is not good that we're making the employees send a check to the government because they need more money. We're like, we can make the uh, the employers they they have money. Let them keep sending the check to the government. But the check that the government that the worker pays is going to be smaller, so the worker can save more money, right? That was the thought, right? If we don't make the worker pay the check to the government, then the worker will have more money. Well, is that really true? OK? Um, so uh, now workers pay 4.2%. Employers still pay 6.2% of the tax. Basically, the whole tax went down. It used to be 12.4%, and now it's, what is that, 10.4%? OK. So the question is, uh, there was a, a reduction in 2% of tax that the, that the employees had to pay. Will the workers pay? Will the employees take home pay rise by 2%? More than 2% or less than 2%? Do any elasticities affect your answer? OK. So here's how we What do you guys think? Do you have any thoughts? Right, so this is tax 1. Or no, sorry. This is tax 1. This is the 12.4%, right? And then the tax two was 10.4%. So there's a smaller tax. OK. So if you look, this is the tax that the, uh, what's this? Me, that I pay, suppliers. This is the tax, the incidence of the tax that Coastline pays. If we look to when the tax cut is, we both pay less tax, me and Coastline, right? Even though Coastline is still technically paying 6.2% of my income, right? if I look at the supply diagram, we're both actually splitting the tax cut together. Does that make sense? So really, does it affect me? Do I get 2% boost in pay from that? No, I split it with Coastline. right? The 2% boost in pay, we split. Okay. And who's going to get more benefit? Do elasticities have anything to do with it? Yeah, they do. Right? Who's ever got the more elastic curve? So let's draw it a, a slightly different. Let's say that Coastline needs an instructor. So they're very inelastic. And Justin only works because it's fun to teach college students, because that's true. Right? So. This would be the equilibrium wage they would pay me, and this would be the equilibrium quantity that they would pay me. Okay, under tax scheme one, we're both paying equal six point two percent. But who's actually paying more of the tax? Coastline. You see that? I'm only paying a little tiny bit. Right. Under tax scheme two, where they lower the tax. Still, Coastline is still paying more than I do of the tax, but who's actually getting more of the tax cuts? Like, who's better off in the blue than the orange? Coastline is actually the one, right? Yeah, I'm gaining a little bit of money, but like, I wasn't paying much tax to begin with, right? And so that 2%, maybe I get like a little tiny bit of that 2%. Really, <laughs> Coastline is the exciting person, the person who's excited, 
Does that make sense? So the idea was that we're going to lower the tax that the workers have to pay from 6.2% to 4.2%, so the workers get a lot of money. Well, if this is true, which it might be, right? In my case, it probably is. Then who is the person who's really uh, excited about, about the tax cut? It really helped the employer, not the employee. Does that make sense? So that's, so that's the idea there. It's a little kind of confusing, but um, uh, that's another example, I think, of people not understanding who really pays the tax. Right? In both of these examples, we see that people are only thinking that, oh, whoever writes the check to the government, they're the person that actually gets harmed. Right? But that's not true at all. We have to throw it on a supply and demand curve and see who bears the incidence of the tax. And that's who's really paying the tax. Not the person who's sending the check to the government. Yeah? That makes sense? Okay. So that's, that's what I just said. All right. So basically, um, conclusion. What did we learn today about government policies? It kind of wrecked. In, in a marketplace that's working perfectly, which may not always happen, but we've assumed that marketplaces are working perfectly. Anytime the government gets involved, no matter what they do, <laughs> it, it makes it the welfare, the welfare decrease of the marketplace, right? It sucks, is what I say. So um, e each of the policies in the chapter, and the three things we looked at, the three ways the government could get involved was a price floor, price ceiling, or tax, all right? It definitely changes the price and quantity, right? It definitely does. There was a tax on the pizza. That was the first example. Um, and well, it reduces the equilibrium quantity. People uh, don't make as much pizza. But I mean, that we might say that it maybe it's not all bad. Maybe other resources become available to other industries. Example number two, we had uh, a binding minimum wage. Uh, and what did the binding minimum wage do? Surplus of workers. What do we call surplus of workers? Unemployment, right? Um, and so it's really important for policymakers to apply these policies very carefully because most of the if the market is working perfectly, this is one of our big ideas, right, from chapter one. The marketplace is usually the best way to do price and quantity. We usually just want to leave it all by itself. Anytime the government gets involved, it, uh, it can lead to a bad outcome. Yeah. Or uh, maybe not a bad outcome, an outcome that's worse than the previous outcome. 